He did a good job, or they should have stuck to the real story. Rapunzel is probably one of the best Disney princesses ever, but will you like her as much once you know what really happened to her? Stay tuned until the end to know how her fairy tale ended. If you love Disney princesses as much as we do, don't forget to subscribe and please give this video a big thumbs up. Today we are showing you the disturbing real story behind Disney's Tangled. The Beginning Once upon a time, there was a man and a woman who always wished to have a child, but every attempt failed. Then one day, the woman was looking through the window and saw a garden filled with the most beautiful herbs and flowers. It belonged to a witch with great power who was feared by everyone, so no one dared to enter there. But when the woman saw some Rapunzel in the garden, she wanted them so badly that she became miserably ill. This was when she asked her husband to get some Rapunzel from the garden or she would die. And he loved her so much that he decided to do it, no matter the cost. This is why he climbed over the high hall in the sorceress's garden to steal the Rapunzel. His wife ate it and asked for more, but the second time he went into the garden, the man got caught by the witch. This is why she asked for the first child that his wife would bring to the world, and she would take care of it like a mother. The man agreed, and this is how the little Rapunzel was adopted by the witch. But instead of treating her like her own child, she locked her in a tower with only a little window when she was 12 years old. Whenever she wanted to see her, she just had to ask Rapunzel to let down her hair, and she climbed up. The Prince Rapunzel was feeling really lonely in her tower. That was until a prince was riding through the forest. He heard the beautiful voice of the young woman who was singing in her tower. Unfortunately, he couldn't find any way to climb up the tower. He came back another day and saw the witch climbing up her hair. This is why he had the idea to pretend that he was the witch, asked Rapunzel to let down her hair, and climbed up. The young woman had never seen a man before, and she was terrified. But then, he began talking to her in a friendly manner, and she lost her fear. He immediately asked her if she would take him as her husband, and she immediately said, yes. However, she didn't know how to get down. This is why she asked him to bring a strand of silk every time he would come to the tower. This way, she would be able to weave a ladder and she would climb down when it would be finished. Then, he would have the chance to take her on his horse. This is why they made sure that they would be able to see each other every evening to make sure that the witch wouldn't see him during the day. However, their fairy tale ended when the young Rapunzel made one big mistake the pregnancy. In the latest version of the story, Rapunzel was simply dumb enough to ask a really stupid question. Out of nowhere, she asked the witch why it was more difficult to pull her up compared to the young prince, who will be arriving any moment now. But another version of the story is a little less appropriate for children. When you know that the prince didn't mind climbing up Rapunzel's hair every night, you probably guess that his intention was not only to bring her a strand of silk. After all, it would have been easier to simply bring a ladder, and the couple would have been able to run away together. But the prince was really interested in being in her room every night, and you know what this can lead to. The young woman innocently asked the witch why her waistband was getting bigger. This is when the witch understood that the young Rapunzel was pregnant. The couple had been having fun before marriage, and the prince never told her that she could get pregnant from this. This was when the witch understood that she had been seeing a man during all this time, even though she had tried to remove her from the world. Then, the witch decided to punish her, and this is not something that any kid would like to see. The tragedy. When she found out that Rapunzel had been betraying her during all this time, she decided to cut off her hair. Then, she took the pregnant young woman into the wilderness where she suffered greatly. On the same day, the witch decided to stay in the tower and tied the cut off hair to the hook at the top of the tower. By the way, that means that Rapunzel would have been able to escape on her own if she cut her hair. But she also told the witch about her prince, so she was probably not that smart after spending so many years alone in a tower. Anyway, the prince asked Rapunzel to let down her hair, and this was when the witch let down the cut-off hair to trick him. The prince climbed up the tower, and this was when he found the witch who was waiting for him. She told him, You have come for your mistress, darling, but that beautiful bird is no longer sitting in her nest, nor is she singing anymore. The cat got her and will scratch your eyes out as well. You have lost Rapunzel. You will never see her again. The prince was overcome with grief, and he threw himself from the tower. He survived, but fell into thorns that poked out his eyes. The end. That couldn't be a fairy tale without a happy ending. But unfortunately, it wasn't as good as it seems. The prince had become blind, and he wandered around in the forest eating nothing but grass and roots. But the most terrible thing was probably that he lost the love of his life. That was until he finally found the place where Rapunzel has been living, with the twins she had given birth to. That means that she had given birth alone in the wilderness, even though she didn't even know what pregnancy was. The prince heard a voice that sounded familiar. He approached it, and this is when Rapunzel finally recognized 
him. The young woman then threw her arms around his neck, crying. Two of her tears fell into his eyes, and the prince wasn't blind anymore. This was when he was able to lead her into his kingdom, where he and his new family were received with joy. In another version of the story, Rapunzel had to live alone in the desert, which makes things worse. But both stories had the same happy ending. The young couple then lived happily ever after with their two kids. We all think that we know how the story of Cinderella goes, but there's some things we didn't know, and those things can be dark, disturbing, and just bizarre. Stay tuned to the end to see how the story really finishes. Today, we are going to tell you the disturbing real story behind Cinderella. While the Cinderella story we all know and love is a nice, sweet tale about good people getting their rewards and bad people being punished, it hasn't always been so family-friendly. One of the more grotesque and gory versions of the story was the one written by German storytellers, the Brothers Grimm. This is Cinderella, just not as we know it. In this version, Cinderella is the daughter of a wealthy merchant, whose wife dies. When he remarries, things take a turn for the worst. However, Cinderella's new stepsisters aren't the ugly sisters who we are used to. They are actually beautiful, but have cruel personalities. And in the Brothers Grimm's telling of the tale, the wicked stepmother barely makes an appearance. Anyway, the sisters call cinders Aschenputtel, which is German for Ashful. There are other differences too. There is no sign of the fairy godmother anywhere in the story. Here, cinders has a magical hazel tree which she waters with her tears and grows above her mother's grave. When she wishes for something by the tree, a bird comes and gives it to her. And when the prince holds his ball, the bird gives her clothes of silver and gold. That includes golden rather than glass slippers. But where it gets really dark is after the ball. The prince finds her golden slipper and fits it on the two stepsisters who both cut off some of their toes to get it to fit. Gross! They are then caught when the bird sings the rhyme, Turn and peep, there's blood within the shoe. The shoe is too small for her, the true bride waits for you. Very different from the version of the story that we are all used to. We all know that the story of Cinderella is old, sure, but do you know just how old it is? Well, the very first example of what would later become the fairy tale that we all know and love came out in around the year 7 BC. Yes, it's at least 2,000 years old. This version of the story is about a woman called Rhodopis, who was a lady of the court of the pharaoh of Egypt. In this book, Geographica, the Greek geographer Strabo recounts a tale that was told by the people of ancient Egypt. Egypt. He says that while Rhodopis is having a bath, an eagle flew down and stole one of her sandals while her handmaiden's back was turned. The eagle flew all the way to where the king was and dropped it on his lap. The pharaoh was so determined to find the woman who had belonged to that he sent men to find her. When they found Rhodopis, they brought her to the monarch who fell in love with her and made her his queen. Of course, this is a long way from the story that we are familiar with, but it's the start of something. One of the most famous parts of the story in Cinderella is the glass slipper, which Cinderella loses on the way back from the ball. When the handsome prince finds it, he becomes determined to track down its owner. When the shoe fits Cinderella, the prince marries her. However, there is a bit of controversy stemming from what is believed by some to be a mistranslation. The most famous version of the story is the one told by French writer Charles Perrault. He is the person who gave us the idea of a glass slipper being used by the prince to identify his future bride. However, some people believe that it was really a slipper made of squirrel fur. That is because the French for glass, verre, and squirrel fur, verre, are very similar sounding words. This has led to a particularly dark and twisted interpretation of the story. The idea is that the prince testing out the fur slipper is a reference to the medieval practice of droit de seigneur. That was when a lord was able to spend the night with any woman who lived in the area he ruled over. Like we said, pretty dark stuff. While the story of Cinderella is something that we all know, it has many influences. Some of the stories that gave birth to the tale that we tell today are pretty disturbing. One of them is the story of Fair, Brown, and Trembling. This is a folk tale that comes from Ireland. It's about a king, Ed Carucha, who has three daughters called Fair, Brown, and Trembling. Trembling is the most powerful of the three, so the other two hate her and pick on her. Sounds pretty familiar, right? When the son of the king of the land of Emania is 
betrothed to Fair, Trembling is sad because she has no dress to wear to church. However, the woman who looks after the royal chickens granted her some magic items which gave her a dress which meant the prince fell in love with her. Trembling lost her shoe riding from the church, which is how the prince found her. However, that's where it gets pretty dark. Fair later pushes Trembling into the sea, and a whale swallows her. She disguises herself as her sister, but the prince is able to see through her disguise. In the end, Fair gets abandoned in a barrel. A long time ago, when children were told stories, they weren't just something to keep them entertained. No, they were expected to teach them lessons about life, how to behave, and morality. The version of Cinderella that most modern tellings of the story are based on was written by the French author Charles Perrault in the 17th century. All the things that you would come to expect from the tale are in there, but there is a lesson to be learned. That sort of thing might strike modern readers as being a little bit unusual, but it was commonplace back in those days. With Cinderella, there are two morals. One is that graciousness is more important than beauty, and the other is that you can have anything, but it could not bring you any success unless you had some kind of blessing. As we said, not what we'd expect to find at the end of a story now, but we wondered, were there any more disturbing, dark, and odd things behind the story of Cinderella? If you know any of them, then don't be shy and tell us in the comments. Peter Pan is arguably one of Disney's best films, but there are some dark things things behind the story that you may not have known. Stay tuned to find out why Peter Pan may not be the good guy you thought he was. Changing Stories Kids aren't really big fans of change, are they? That's why whenever they have to change schools or a new baby comes into the family, there are usually some big issues that come up. But with Disney films, kids usually don't have to worry about change. The films start out the same way every time. But Peter Pan wasn't always so reliable. In fact, the film actually started out as a play. Then it was turned into a novel in 1911 called Peter and Wendy. The play first opened in London in 1904. The weird thing about the story, though, was that it was always changing. Its creator, J. M. Barry, was always updating it. The script changed every year. The version of the story that we've all seen is the one from the late 1950s, early 1960s. Can you imagine if Disney movies changed like that? Part of the appeal of them is that you can watch them when you're young and then come back when you're older and still get the same joy and excitement out of the storyline that you had when you were a kid. If the story changed every year, we wouldn't feel nearly the same amount of joy that we do now. The movies would never be classics because classics don't change. Fairy Dust You'd never think of Peter Pan as being a movie that is not safe for kids to watch. The whole object of the movie is to be a kid forever, so of course, the movie has to be okay for kids to watch. Unfortunately, that wasn't always true. In fact, the original story of Peter Pan was actually a bit of a health hazard for children. Don't know what we're talking about? Okay, let's break it down. So in the original versions of the story, Peter Pan and the Lost Boys could fly on their own. This caused kids who knew the story to try their own hand at flying. There were reports popping up everywhere of kids jumping from their beds and trying to fly. Of course, all these kids soon learned that they could not fly, but not before they were left with injuries. To combat this, J. M. Barry added fairy dust to the story. In the newer versions of the tale, fairy dust is a necessary component of flying. This made the story much safer for kids to watch. Since no kids had their own little fairy or fairy dust lying around, there were way fewer injuries after this element was added to the story. The Lost Boys When watching the film, you probably thought how great it would be to be a Lost Boy, to never have to grow up, to stay young and have fun forever. But that eternal youthfulness may not have been all that it seemed. In fact, there is one line in the story that people tend to just skip over. But this one line shows what might be a horrible, horrible truth going on behind the scenes. The line in the story says, The boys on the island vary, of course in numbers, according as they get hurt and so on. And when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But at this time, there were six of them, counting the twins as two. Did you hear that? When they start to age, Peter thins them out, as in Peter gets rid of them. Some users on Reddit have suggested that the way Peter gets rid of the Lost Boys is by dropping them over crocodile-infested waters, which is pretty morbid and not really something we want to spend too much time dwelling on. We just can't believe that Peter Pan may be a murderer, but it is right there in the line of the story. Of course, Disney didn't include that in the film. 
hating adults. Okay, so we all know that Peter Pan was obsessed with staying young forever, which in itself is a little creepy. He probably should have been seeing a therapist to work out his issues of never wanting to age. Anyway, Peter's fear and disdain of growing older may have caused him to actually hate adults. And we don't mean in the normal I don't like adults because they have too many rules way. We mean like really hate them. There is a line in the story that reads, as soon as he got inside his tree, he breathed intentionally quick short breaths at the rate of about five to a second. He did this because there is a saying in the Neverland that every time you breathe, a grown-up dies. And Peter was killing them off vindictively as fast as possible. See, Peter was kind of evil. Even if you don't like adults, you shouldn't be out to get rid of them all. What kind of horrible person does that? Peter, apparently. We definitely see why Disney left this part of the story out. We can't imagine that parents would have allowed their children to watch the film if that part had been included. Stealing Boys The author of the Peter Pan story may have actually been a much darker version of Peter Pan in real life. Why? Because apparently he stole his own crew of Lost Boys. Basically what J.M. Barry did was manipulate his way into the lives of two people named Sylvia and Arthur Llewellyn Davies. The Davies had three children, George, Jack, and Peter. Throughout the lives of the kids, J.M. spent lots of money on gifts for the family and would spend lots of time playing with the boys, having fun in the park and making up stories. Later. Arthur and Sylvia both died of cancer within a three-year time span of each other. When this happened, Barry took guardianship of the boys. The real kicker is that he forged Sylvia's will so that he could take custody of the kids. None of the children's actual relatives ever objected to him taking the children. Years later, once Peter had grown up, he said that the whole thing with Barry taking custody of him and his brothers was the most pathetic and ludicrous thing that someone could have done. Either this is an extremely sad tale or a very creepy one. Perhaps J.M. really did want the best for the kids, but forging a will and lying is not the way to go about it. Relationship to Michael Okay, we may have to take back what we said about J.M. maybe wanting what was best for the boys. Because when you look deeper into the story, the whole thing just gets creepier and creepier. J.M. really loved taking pictures of two of the boys, Michael and George. Sometimes they would be wearing costumes that he made, and sometimes they would be wearing no clothes at all. If a grown man stole children and then was always taking pictures of them today, that would have raised several flags. But for some reason, no one really seemed to be concerned. He even wrote about his weird relationship with the boys in this book, The Little White Bird. Even though the book described him doing some weird things, it was really popular when it was published. To make matters worse, in June of 1908, J.M. wrote a letter to Michael for his eighth birthday that was so creepy it gives us chills. It said, I wish I could be with you and your candles. You can look on me as one of your candles, the one that burns badly. Dear Michael, I am very fond of you, but don't tell anybody. Um, gross. Never Loving J.M. Barry did get married. Maybe you're thinking that after his marriage, he, the boys, and his wife were one big happy family. But that isn't the case at all. In fact, J.M. may have never even loved his wife at all. His wife, Mary Ansel, once wrote, Love in its fullest sense could never be felt by him or experienced. Isn't that horrible? Can you imagine being married to a man who could never feel love? I wonder what made her marry him in the first place. It is also wildly believed that J.M. was unable to have children, which may have been part of why he felt he needed to steal some. Eventually, Mary grew tired of being unloved by her husband and sought affection somewhere else. She ended up having an affair with one of her husband's friends, which led to their divorce. Disney doesn't tell you this morbid backstory about the creator of their beloved film. There have been movies about J.M. Barry, and most of this stuff is left out. He is painted as quite a kind man, and not at all someone who is unable to love as his former wife Mary thought. Everyone left. Okay, this is the last one about J.M. Barry. We just had to point this out. If you're on the fence about the character of the creator of the play, consider this. Everyone left him. When George and Peter were old enough, they both volunteered to serve in World War I. Many said that this was the boy's way of getting away from J.M. Sadly, George passed away in the war while he was in Belgium. He was only 21. When Michael was 21, he passed away as well. But in this case, he took his own life. He drowned himself in the River Thames. Peter, the last surviving adoptive son, of J.M. also took his own life. He passed away at 63 when he stepped in front of a train. Before he passed away, he destroyed most of the letters that his adopted father had written to him and his brothers. He said that the letters were simply too much. Taking all of these things into account, you can see that the real story behind Peter Pan is really tragic. That's probably why Disney tried to sweep it under the rug. Who would allow their children to watch a movie created by such a strange and possibly horrible man? 
The Original Story In the original story of Peter Pan, he was only a week old baby when he left home, and he never aged past that. In the story, Peter thought that his mother would always love him, and always would leave a window open for him to return. Because he wasn't worried about losing his mother's affection, he spent all of his time playing with the fairies and the birds and never worried about going back home. The problem is that while Peter is away, time is still clicking forward. When he finally does decide to go back home, he's too late. His mother has barred the windows so that he can no longer enter. And to make matters worse, she has a new baby. Peter then believes that his mother's love was not unconditional, as he once thought, and he'd been replaced. When you view the story like this, it's quite sad. No one wants to believe that their mother could just get over them and move on. No one wants to believe that if they play outside for just a bit too long, that maybe when they come back, their mother will have a new baby. Maybe that's why Disney added all those frills and feel-good moments to the story, so that people could come away from the movie feeling good and not depressed. Peter Pan is the villain. In both the book and the play, Peter Pan has no problem with murdering people. He does so to the pirates pretty easily, and then as we mentioned earlier, he may have also been doing the same to the Lost Boys who got too old. In the book, he also alters the bodies of the Lost Boys so they can all fit through the tree holes to get to their underground dwellings. How he alters their bodies isn't really specified, but we can only think that he's probably cutting off things or breaking things so they can fit into smaller places. Another thing that makes him a villain villain is that he can't tell the difference between what's real and what's fake. Sometimes he gives the Lost Boys pretend meals and then won't believe them when they say they're still hungry. In addition to this, the Lost Boys are always in serious danger in the play and the book. But instead of being concerned for them, Peter usually finds the danger entertaining. He always saves the boys, but he doesn't save them because he loves them. He does it so that he can have a chance to save them again and show off how clever he is. Isn't that just a little bit irritating? We all know and love the Disney classic Pocahontas, but the truth behind the story is actually a lot more messed up than anyone ever thought. Stay tuned to find out why John Smith and Pocahontas may have never actually been in love. The Film Was it just us, or was Pocahontas one of your favorite Disney princesses too? She was a total boss. Whereas most princesses are kind of meek and gentle and do whatever their fathers tell them, in the film, Pocahontas was her own person. She did what she wanted and she never took no for an answer. Okay, if you aren't familiar with the film, first of all, what have you been doing with your life? But we'll be kind and back up a little bit. So, the Disney film centers around Pocahontas, who is the daughter of the chief of the Powhatan tribe. At the beginning of the movie, our favorite heroine learns that her father wants to marry her off to Cocoam, who seems seems nice and is super hot, but Pocahontas just doesn't love him. During all of this time, the British settlers come to Pocahontas' land. John Smith, one of the settlers, is less interested in the gold that his crew came to find and more interested about actually exploring the new world. While he is exploring, he meets and falls in love with Pocahontas, but their love affair is pretty doomed because John tells his leader that there is no gold in the land and instead of backing off, the leader declares that they will wipe out all of the natives. Seems reasonable, right? In the midst of all this secret romance and battling, Thomas, one of John's friends, ends up taking Kokoam's life. Later, John is taken as captive, but instead of letting him be hurt, Pocahontas throws herself in front of John and begs her father to save him and not to start a war. John is spared, but does end up getting a gunshot wound and has to travel back to England for treatment. But before they part, Pocahontas promises John that he will always be in her heart. So cute, right? Well, it's all a bunch of make-believe. Pocahontas is the first Disney movie that was created about a real-life person, except Disney didn't actually include many of the real details. The Real Story Here's what really happened. Apparently, Pocahontas' mother died giving birth to her. Her birth name was actually Matoica, which means flower between two streams, and was probably given to her because she was born between the rivers of the Mataponi and the Pamunkey. After her mother died, Pocahontas' father was really sad, and Pocahontas became his favorite child because she looked so much like her mother. She was raised by her aunts and other women in their tribe. During that time, it was customary for the paramount chief to have other wives. Lives. So Pocahontas' dad had a few other wives in other villages. So the family wasn't just Pocahontas and her dad like the movie made it seem. Here's where the story starts to get creepy. According to her tribe history, Pocahontas was only about 10 years old when John Smith and the colonists arrived in 1607. John Smith was around 27, so if they did have something going on, it would have been absolutely disgusting. Luckily, they were actually never married or even involved with one another. The children of Pocahontas' 
tribe were all watched very carefully, and because she was a princess of sorts, she was probably watched even more closely and provided with cultural training that the other children did not get. On the other side, in the movie, we saw John Smith as this guest guy who saw all men as equal and was both equally kind and hot. In real life, the native people stayed away from him because he was known to go into people's villages and put guns to their heads and demand food and other supplies. In the winter, John Smith met with the Powhatan warriors and ended up being captured by the chief's brother. Luckily for John, the Powhatans agreed with the English on one thing. They both feared being attacked by the Spanish, so they formed an alliance. After a while, the tribe began to like John and offered him a role as a leader and gave him a better area to live in. After many years passed, John said that Pocahontas saved his life during the four-day process where he was initiated into a leadership position with the tribe. But according to written accounts from Pocahontas' tribe, that could have never happened. This is for a few reasons. First, the tribe wouldn't have been trying to hurt him if he was receiving such a big honor. Second, children weren't allowed in any of the ritual ceremonies, so Pocahontas wouldn't have been allowed to be in attendance. So though the movie showed Pocahontas selflessly throwing herself in front of John Smith, that never happened in real life. Pocahontas also never actually defied her dad to bring food to John Smith and his crew in Jamestown. Why not? Well, because Jamestown was 12 miles from where Pocahontas lived. There's no way a 10-year-old girl would have traveled that far alone, especially not a chief's daughter. If she did somehow manage to escape her father and her people to head to Jamestown, she would have had to cross several bodies of water. That would have required using one of the 400-pound canoes that her tribe had. There was no way she could have lived lifted one of those canoes into the water by herself. So Pocahontas actually didn't have much at all to do with John Smith. When she was 15 or 16, she actually did marry Cocoam, had a child with him, and moved to his village. Soon, a colonist named Samuel Argall went to look for Pocahontas in order to capture her. He demanded that the tribe give her up or suffer an attack. She was forced to leave her child in the village and go with Samuel. Though she went as she was told, Cocoam was still attacked after she left. Later, Pocahontas married Englishman John Ralph and converted to Christianity. Christianity. Some say that she married him for love, but she was never allowed to see her family again, so it doesn't sound like the relationship was very mutually beneficial. John Ralph is mentioned in the second Pocahontas film, and she does go on to marry him in the movie, but Disney conveniently leaves out the kidnapping and how the two ended up meeting, probably because no one would be able to sleep through the night after hearing the real story. We all love The Lion King, but do you know that it was actually based on a real story? And it wasn't just one. Stay tuned to hear more about the strange biblical story that was one of The Lion King's main inspirations. Hamlet did you know that The Lion King was actually a loose adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet? The stories share a lot of similarities, and if you take away the adorable animals, it's actually pretty disturbing. It's hard to believe such a heartwarming Disney movie could share the same story as one of Shakespeare's longest plays. To make things worse, the story of Hamlet was actually based on a true story, so keep that in mind when you watch The Lion King. Stay tuned to hear a summary of Hamlet and some of the similarities this disturbing story shared with one of our favorite Disney movies. We'll also also show you another weird story that was an inspiration for a lot of Lion King moments. The Real Story Hamlet is all about the Prince of Denmark, the depressed and bitter son of the late King Hamlet. Just like Simba, the Prince of Denmark was an only child without any other siblings, so all focus is on him throughout the play. Hamlet's story begins when we get to meet his uncle Claudius, who has already become a king. It's implied that there's a chance this was done by intentionally ending his brother's life. Sounds familiar? Yes, but we bet it's also pretty disturbing when there's actual people involved, right? But let's continue. Hamlet also also has a friend from college called Horatio, who helps him on several occasions throughout the story. He also ends up falling out with two university friends after it's revealed they're just spies who are actually working for Claudius. Things get even more complicated. In the early stages of the story, Claudius marries Hamlet's mother and becomes his own enemy's stepfather. When Hamlet hears the details of his father's murder from a ghost who claims to be his father's spirit, he decides to take revenge. To make things even worse, Claudius is not 
the only person young Hamlet has to worry about. When his father was still alive, he won the battle for a disputed piece of land and ended up killing King Fordenbras. The king's son now also wants to avenge the death and the land that once was owned by his father. The story of Hamlet takes an even darker turn in the third act when Hamlet's revenge plan to kill Claudius goes wrong. Instead, he ends up ending the life of Polonius, who was revealed to be Claudius's spy. To make things even more twisted, Polonius has a daughter, Ophelia, who's madly in love with Hamlet, but she also ends up not surviving the play. Polonius's son is desperate to avenge his father's accidental death and ultimately achieve this in the final act of this dark story. The long story is full of mysteries and dark twists that are full of symbolism and disturbing imagery. In fact, one of the most frequent symbols refers to flowers as every flower mentioned in the story has a completely different meaning that defines the character it's intended for. But it seems like Hamlet is also full of various characters dying because of revenge or accident, which seems to also be one of the main themes in the play. So now you know the brief summary of what Hamlet's all about. Let's talk talk about the actual similarities to The Lion King. Similarities as we mentioned before, both Hamlet and Simba were princes without any brothers or sisters. They both also feature a crazy uncle that's jealous of their father's success and wants to take the crown away from them. Both characters also have a single love interest. Of course, both of their fathers are also murdered. While King Hamlet's death isn't quite clear as the only details of the act come from a ghost, we all know far too well what happened to King Mufasa. Another interesting detail is that both fathers reappear as ghosts. Mufasa appears to Simba in the stars, and King Hamlet's an actual ghost. Both characters are also sent to exile. Simba grows up with Timon and Pumbaa, while Hamlet travels to England and even survives an attack by pirates. Both stories are also heavily marked by the tone of revenge, although that might be less obvious in The Lion King. But Simba does take revenge, and we all know hyenas end up taking care of Scar. Claudius, on the other hand, is killed with a sword and poisoned wine. Both stories also have a highlighted internal struggle that drives the main characters to their ultimate acts. In The Lion King, we see Simba struggle with the decision to become a king as he's too ashamed of his past and childhood mistakes. On the other hand, Hamlet has to decide whether or not he wants to take revenge by ending another person's life. Joseph but it's not just Hamlet. The Lion King also shares a few similarities with the biblical story of Joseph, and the writers admitted they took inspiration from the Old Testament's book of Genesis. The story focuses on Joseph, the overambitious son of Jacob. Jacob had 10 other children who were all aware that Joseph was the favorite. They wanted revenge and sold Joseph to slave traders while telling their father that his son was killed by wild animals. After a long journey with plenty of moments in between, Joseph eventually ends up in a position of power and allows him to punish his brothers and becomes reunited with his father. He also has the power over the land and makes sure his family is well off for the rest of their time, while the story of Hamlet is definitely the one that shares more characteristics and similarities to the one and only Lion King. The Disney movie was actually inspired by plenty of biblical stories like this one. And to be completely honest with you, they're all kind of disturbing when you realize these are human characters and not adorable animals and lions that are just learning how to roar. Plus, without a funky musical number, the whole situation is really dark, especially for a story that's meant to be for kids. It's hard to believe these creepy stories were actually the base for one of Disney's most iconic movies, isn't it? We all watched the Disney movie The Little Mermaid, but only a few of us know what really happened to Ariel in the original tale, and this is not a fairy tale story for kids. Make sure you watch this video until the end to know if the mermaid lives happily ever after or not. If you love The Little Mermaid as much as we do, don't forget to subscribe and please give this video a big thumbs up. Today, we are showing you the messed up origins of The Little Mermaid. Here's what Hans Christian Andersen wrote in 1836 in a tale called The Little Mermaid. Once again, the Little Mermaid was one of the king's daughters, and the most beautiful of them. But this time, everyone, including her sisters, was fascinated by the human world, and what she loved more was a marble statue of a handsome man. Her grandmother told her everything about the human world, and unlike Scuttle, she was actually really wise. She told the Little Mermaid about the day when she was going to turn 15 and have the right to rise up out of the sea, sit on the rocks in the moonlight, and see what is happening 
remain on the land. The Little Mermaid, who was the youngest daughter in her family, waited several years for that day. Her sisters kept talking about what they saw, and the youngest couldn't wait for the day when she was going to see it too. At first, they were amazed, but after visiting this place too often, they became indifferent and didn't care anymore. When the moment she had been waiting for finally came, the Little Mermaid rose to the surface of the sea. This is when she saw a boat, came closer to it, and noticed a really handsome prince. It was love at first sight, but then a storm came, her man fell in the water, and she had to save him. As she lay on the shore, she kissed his forehead and admired the man who looked just like the marble statue that she used to love. She waited until someone came to help him and then left. The Little Mermaid couldn't forget this man and she spent many nights in the water near his palace to watch the young prince. Unlike her sisters, she kept loving this new world more every time. She learned more about him every day and even heard the fishermen talking about how great he was. The Little Mermaid wished that she could be part of his world, however, she realized that they were actually really different. In this tale, humans could die while mermaids could live up to 300 years, but humans also had a soul that lives forever, while sea creatures just ceased to exist when they died. This was one of the main reasons why the Little Mermaid wanted to become a real woman. Her grandmother tried to convince her that mermaids lived to be much happier and much better than humans, but the young girl didn't mind. She could die for her prince if it meant being happy as stars in the sky forever. But her grandmother told her that the only way she could have an immortal soul was if the man fell in love with her. If they ever got married, his soul would glide in her body and they would be united. This is why, while everyone was at the ball, she decided that she would do anything it would take to meet her prince. Her grandmother told her that a fish tail was beautiful under the sea but looked disgusting on earth, and this is why she had to find a way to have legs. She went to see the sorceress and even the sea witch said that she was stupid, but there was something she could do for her. The little mermaid could drink a draught that would make her tail disappear and turn into legs that would make her the prettiest little human being they ever saw. But this transformation will feel as if a sword was passing through her and every step she takes would feel like she was treading upon sharp knives. If she could bear with this, the sorceress would help her. And the little mermaid was so desperate that she said yes. The sea witch had to warn her that once she became human, she will never see the ones that she loves ever again and only become foam on the crest of the waves. It wasn't enough to stop the young girl, but then the sorceress said that she had to pay the prince. In exchange for a pair of legs, she had to give away her voice. The mermaid said yes one last time and the sorceress cut off her tongue before preparing the draught. The little mermaid didn't even take the time to say goodbye to those she loved as she felt too dumb after making that choice. When she rose up through the dark blue waters to go on the shore and drink the magic draught, she felt like a two-edged sword went through her delicate body and fell, just like she was dead. As she discovered from the sharp pain, a prince stood beside her. He took her to his palace, but every step she took felt as if treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives. But she mostly felt dumb, as she couldn't speak when this handsome man tried to talk to her. She was jealous when she heard a beautiful slave singing. Her voice was so beautiful that the prince was only looking at her, but the Little Mermaid stole the show when she finally had the chance to dance with the prince, even though she was suffering during all this time. She spent more and more time with her lover, kissing and cuddling, but she kept smiling while she couldn't stop thinking about the pain. As the day passed, she was more in love with the prince, but he loved this silent girl only as he would love a child and not as his future wife. He even called her his dumb child child. The prince needed to find a beautiful princess to marry, but he only had one on his mind. He kept thinking about the woman who saved his life, and the little mermaid couldn't tell him that it was her. The prince finally met a woman who was so beautiful that he thought that she was the one who saved him and told the little mermaid that he was finally happy. But the young girl was heartbroken, and it hurt more than her legs. His wedding was going to bring her to death. She held up the bride's train and danced 
all night, no matter how painful it was, as it was the last night that she would spend with her prince. As she looked at the sea, the little mermaid saw her sister. They had heard about this tragedy and gave their hair to the witch in exchange for a knife. If the young girl plunged it in the heart of the prince before the sun rises, she would become a mermaid again and have the chance to be with her family again. But she couldn't do it. The little mermaid threw away the knife and threw herself into the sea, where her body dissolved into foam. But she didn't die. She became one of the daughters of the air. By her good deeds, she had earned an immortal soul. She would be flying around the world in the air until after 300 years she should float into the kingdom of heaven. And this is how the Little Mermaid had the chance to live her happily ever after in peace away from pain. The Disney movie Aladdin is full of colorful and funny characters singing catchy songs as they fly around on a magic carpet. It's a high-flying tale of romance, magic, and adventure. But the real story is actually pretty messed up. The original author before we dive into the actual story of Aladdin, which is part of a saga called Arabian Nights or 1001 Nights, we have to talk about the woman who created the stories. According to The Atlantic, Arabian Nights is a set of folktales that was passed down orally until the 9th century and then compiled into a bunch of different written versions and translations. Each translator put their own spin on these stories depending on their perspective and the times they were living in. But the truth about the original creation on these stories is pretty messed up. So, a long time ago, a psycho Persian king had a crazy reputation for slaying his new brides after their wedding night and finding a new wife in the morning. There was a clever chick by the name of Shaharazad who knew about the king's reputation. She was forced to marry this deranged lunatic, but she had a little trick up her sleeve. Every night before he went to sleep, she would tell the king a story and end it with a cliffhanger to keep him in suspense. This kept the king hooked while ensuring she would live another night because he wanted to find out how the story ended. This girl basically invented the cliffhanger in order to save her own skin. The result was a series of folktales that have been handed handed down over the years, translated into a bunch of different languages, and eventually became a Disney movie that we all loved. Shaharazad probably would have loved Robin Williams' portrayal of the genie. A common theme in these stories is the cleverness of women to overcome oppression, acclaimed Lebanese author Hanan al-Sheikh, who retold stories of Arabian Nights, had a very interesting take on this series. She said she believes Shaharazad's power over the king does not stop with her ability to keep herself alive by entertain him. Ultimately, she exerts far more power over him than that. The author says each story was a plea for reason and mercy. Through all these stories, she is trying to influence the king and maybe even brainwash him. These stories, Hanan al-Sheikh believes, slowly taught the king to give up his evil tendencies and hatred of women. In her stories, Shaharazad mirrors her own predicament. All of her characters are pleading for life in their own way. She cleverly disguised these stories, making the characters and topics slightly different. But the author pointed out that the main point of these stories is that you cease to be a human being if you steep yourself in brutality and evil. It's important to note that the story of Aladdin was not added to the collection of Arabian Nights until much later by a French translator named Antoine Galland. Still, the story of Aladdin suddenly becomes much more intriguing when you think about a woman making it up on the spot for a mad king in order to save her own life. The Origin Many people know that Aladdin was originally set in China. Because of the storyteller's Persian roots, Hollywood set the story in the Middle East with films like The Thief of Baghdad from 1924 and 1940, and of course, Disney's Aladdin. But actually, the character Aladdin was Chinese. And originally, he wasn't a crafty orphan either. The first version depicted him as a lazy dude who lived at home with his mom. That's far less appealing, right? No wonder they changed the part. The Disney film was originally to be set in Baghdad, but the U.S. was attacking Baghdad in the first Gulf War while the film was in production. So Disney decided to change the setting to the fictional city of Agrabah. Probably a good idea on their part. Racism there are a lot of racial stereotypes in Disney's animated version of Aladdin, but did you know that they actually had to change the lyrics to the opening song because it was considered super racist? Arab American activists protested and caused Disney to change the lyrics after the film had already been released, which is unprecedented. We'll get to those lyrics in a minute. The song wasn't the only thing the Arab community had a problem with. According to Don Bustany, the president of the Los Angeles chapter of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination 
Animation Committee, there still remains the very sleazy burlesque character in the prologue, and the scene where a merchant is going to cut off the hand of Princess Jasmine because she took an apple from his stand to give to a hungry child. Fustini said what's even worse is that the supporting characters are all depicted as nasty, mean people. While the Aladdin character Jasmine and her father speak with no accent, standard Americanized English, all the bad guys speak in foreign accents. The lesson is that anyone with a foreign accent is bad. He called it horrendous racism. Now back to those song lyrics. Part of the original lyrics in the opening number of Aladdin sang about a faraway place where the camels roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. Then the lyrics say, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Yikes. That's pretty dicey for a Disney cartoon. After angry protests and criticism from the Arab community, Disney changed the lyrics to have the characters sing about a faraway place where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense. They left the part where they say it's barbaric. Disney made the change after several meetings with the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. Disney distribution president Dick Cook said it was something they did because they wanted to do it. He said in no way would they ever do anything that would be insensitive to anyone. So on reflection, they changed it. Still, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee was not completely happy with the change and requested to have the word barbaric removed from the song as well. But Disney refused, saying that the word barbaric referred to the land and the heat, and not to the people. What do you think? Should they have changed the word barbaric? It appears we still have a long way to go with learning how to be kind, inclusive, and tolerant. But as Aladdin has taught us, it's never too late to apologize and make things right. Let's hope Disney has learned from this and applies it to the remake. They have an opportunity to create a film from a story that was born from horrible oppression and perhaps turn it into a triumph of the human spirit, an inclusive celebration of culture, and a few more catchy tunes that have us tapping our toes rather than shaking our heads. A tale as old as time sounds romantic, but if it hadn't been changed to the Disney movie we know and love, there's a good chance you might not be as much of a Beauty and the Beast fan. Keep watching to find out how Belle was meant to ease the fear of an arranged marriage. The recent Beauty and the Beast live-action movie features one of Hollywood's most beloved feminists, Emma Watson. It's difficult not to look for elements of equality in a movie that continues to be such a big part of our childhoods. However, like any narrative, it's important to examine where the story comes from. If anything, unveiling the story's darker past might even add to our current appreciation of the film and the corresponding adjustments and tweaks the story has undergone throughout its life. Not always so strong and independent. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to our interpretations of the love story between Belle and the Beast. For example, many fans perceive Belle's ability to make her own decisions as a sign of her independence, like when she courageously sets out to save her father. This is impressive for a Disney princess as she strives to defy the patriarchy that tries to limit her usefulness to solely her good looks. Some have gone as far as viewing Belle as a feminist character. Though this may be true for our perspective in our current social climate, the tale originated as part of the oral storytelling tradition. This would have been decades prior to any social or civil rights movement, making it impossible for Belle to be a feminist in her cultural and historical context. Where does the story come from? Looking at where the story of Beauty and the Beast originated is very helpful in understanding how far our interpretation of Belle has come. A professor of folklore and mythology, Marie Tater, explained how this contextual change happened. Tater divulged in a Glamour interview that the story of Beauty and the Beast has existed among communities for longer than we can track. The story we know and love was first published in print by French author Madame Gabrielle Suzanne de Veneuve. In this version, Belle is a good fairy and the descendant of a king. This tale was based on the real story of Petrus Gonsalves and his bride Catherine. Petrus was afflicted by a condition called hypertrichinosis, which caused excessive hair growth all over his body. He was initially adopted by the French royal family for their amusement. Petrus would go on to marry Catherine and they became a celebrity couple, so using them as inspiration for a printed version of the existing oral tale makes sense. After all, people want to read about things they have experience with. However, it was a French author, Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont, who wrote a second print version of the fairy tale. Beaumont's version was meant to serve as a lesson for girls ranging from ages as young as 5 to 13. Her goal was not to empower young women and inspire them to make their own decisions, quite the opposite. Beauty and the Beast was meant to prove to young 18th century readers that arranged marriages aren't as bad as they may seem. 
For a girl, a potential husband who was older and much hairier would not be so unlike the beast Belle eventually falls for. By the time it was rewritten by Beaumont, Belle was no longer royalty, but instead the daughter of an inventor. The purpose of this was to ensure that the story would be relatable to a French population that was becoming increasingly frustrated by the growth of an aristocratic class. The story was then interpreted into the version we know best by an English author named Andrew Lang. This version was the most popular as it was translated into several languages and served as the inspiration for movies and songs. The Disney Version Finally, in the most recent live-action film, director Bill Condon added another modification. In this version, Belle is an inventor who creates a washing machine to provide her with more time for reading. The nature of the invention has also been criticized as relying too heavily on gender roles. We can use this as a true testament of how far audiences have come. The Disney animated and live-action narrative suggests that Belle makes an independent decision to save her father and sacrifices her own freedom in exchange. The Beast, depicted as angry and violent, eventually succumbs to Belle's intelligence and kindness and they find a love that transcends appearance. This is not the case in the original story. Instead, Belle is sent to live with the Beast, who is more attractive and offers her any luxury she desires. By the end of the story, she accepts her situation and falls in love with the creature she is been destined to marry. This would not have been too unlike young girls who were forced to marry older men. Another theory presented by Tater is that the beast serves as a metaphor for fear itself. Following this logic, the beast is a representation of Belle's fears. Once she confronts these fears and feels at peace with them, she is able to see the beast for who he is as her judgment is no longer clouded by her concerns. Essentially, through the scary image of the beast, the audience is supposed to learn that the worst part of being held captive against your will is your fear. Once you move past that, you will see that life isn't as bad as it seems. Disney found a way to flip this on its head, making sure that the Beast's insecurities were the reason for his harsh attitude towards the rest of society that had exiled him. The Takeaway On one hand, Disney is advocating for a feminist rendition of Beauty and the Beast. On the other hand, we may continue to find fault in the problematic power dynamics that prevail in all retellings of the story. Nevertheless, the movie continues to bring up important questions about what it means to be in a healthy relationship. As long as it's properly contextualized for a young audience, presenting difficult and uncomfortable narratives from an outdated literary tradition might cause us to continue to question the gender roles we still take for granted. According to Disney, Belle's compassion and intelligence allows Beast to show himself for who he is. Instead of Belle having to accept her situation, she helps the Beast confront his own issues and become a better version of himself. Somehow, Disney has successfully turned a story about female oppression and arranged marriages into an inspiring lesson about seeing others for who they truly are. That's it for our video. Don't forget to subscribe to The Things and hit that like button for more videos like this one.